Let me just recapitulate once again. I think it's, it's a healthy activity. So let's see what what were we doing. So we we're trying to study theories that are invariant to the least transformations that we call conformal. These are transformations that preserve <coughs> angles, right? And we found some conditions for these, some differential equations for the generator of the thing. And we found uh, actually what the algebra was. Realized that this algebra was something very similar to, uh, to a Minkowski group, to, sorry, to a Lorentz group, but in one higher dimension with an extra minus. Okay? Found that that was the limit of this transformation. Then we went to two dimensions, and we realized that something special happened. In two dimensions, these transformations correspond to homomorphic transformations. Then what we did is that we promoted, or demoted, so it's a matter of taste, we promoted these uh, transformations to metamorphic transformations, okay? And these metamorphic transformations have an infinite dimensional algebra, okay? So now we have a bunch of symmetries. And the good news about having a bunch of symmetries is that you can constrain a lot your theory, okay? We're not going to get to all the power of these things, but as I was telling to you, uh, last time, sometimes you can even find all the correlators of a theory. Okay? If you've done quantum field theory, you know how hard is the struggle to find even one correlator. Okay? I mean, I'm here I'm talking about the full all loop computation. Okay? You can find it on the Okay? This is actually very remarkable. Okay? So I'm talking about exact correlators. Okay? Now, then we wanted to study fields, right? Ah, and another thing, last thing. So we found that the algebra of these things. Okay, the algebra of these transformations form this thing called the Witt algebra. And then we realized that we could centrally extend this algebra. And uh, last um, afternoon in the tutorial, we found what was the form of this, uh, of this uh, central extension just by imposing the Jacobi identity. Right? So we got very far with very, very simple tricks. Then uh, the other thing we did is that we defined two particular kinds of fields that are going to be very important. One is chiral fields. Does anybody remember what chiral actually means? Holomorphic, right? It's just that. No, no mystery. Chiral fields are holomorphic fields, and anti-chiral are the anti-holomorphic fields. And the other kinds of fields that we studied were these primary fields. Okay? Well, we studied, we, we haven't really done anything with them, but we will. And these primary fields are fields that have a very simple transformation on their conformal maps. Okay? So they are going to be important, for reasons that we will not get to, but probably with Robert, you understood a bit, these are going to be the highest weight states of these representations of the Vida Solo algebra. Okay? So if you keep studying this thing, you will find that you start with the Vida Solo primary, and then you hit it with this L, the negative L, L minus N, and you can get a full family that are called conformal descent. Okay? So now we want to do some, we want to do some uh, actual quantization. Okay, we want to see how the quantization thing works. So as I told you at the end of, of last uh, lecture is that we're going to study, we're going to set the, put the theory on the scene. Okay, we're going to put some quantum field theory, two-dimensional quantum field theory on a cylinder. Okay, we're still going to be working in Euclidean signature. So that means that our choice of space and time are somehow arbitrary, but we're going to make x0 to be time and x1 to be space. So we have time in this direction, we have space in this direction. Okay. Uh, now we're going to map this theory to the plane, to the complex plane. Okay? So that in the complex plane we can use this, once again, all this power of complex analysis. So let's see, let's send it to the plane. And we're going to send it to the plane in such a way, so here we have time equals to minus infinity, so we want to map this to the origin, okay? And we're going to map time equals infinity to the boundary, okay? So that means that time is flowing in this direction. It's flowing in this direction now. And space, I mean a space-like <coughs> space -like region will correspond to a circle, okay? Now, how do you map this? How do you, does anybody know how to map one thing to the other? How to map a cylinder to a plane? Huh? It's just an exponential, right? 
So the map that relates the two things, please, the ones that don't understand it, please think about it. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's an important thing to understand. Okay? It's just an explanation. You see, you will have an e to the minus infinity will be zero, right? Somehow, that's kind of the idea, right? And so that's the way of changing. Now, um, let's see. Now, let's try to, now we have in this guy, we can act with our idea sort of things in principle, right? We can act with conformal transformations on the plane, right? As we discussed before. And the first thing I would like to see if you manage to do is to identify the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is the generator of what? In, in normal classical stuff when you study basic things. The generator of time translations, right? That's, that's what the Hamiltonian does. The Hamiltonian just push, pushes your operator through time. Now, time here has become this radial direction, right? So who's the Hamiltonian in the conformal group? Who does that? Dilatation, right? So the Hamiltonian is going to be given by the generator of dilatations. All right? This is, this is one of the cool things about that. And the other thing that I would like you to see if you figure out, it's very similar, is what is the momentum generator. Notice that here we just have one momentum because we have only one, one space direction, right? The momentum generator, you will find that. It's going to be a combination, and, and this actually, this is not hard to show, we didn't do it, but if you can construct it with the Vila Sol, it's L0 plus L0, R, of course, okay? And then you will find that this one is just going to be L0 minus L0, okay? So remember that the L0 now putting with the capitals, but it's the same as L0, L1, and L1, is the same as the molel, right? And we saw yesterday that these guys will generate Things. Okay? Now, so what we did yesterday, just to remind you, in a little reminder of a couple of important things, a couple of important things, we studied this thing called the stress energy tensor, right? The stress energy tensor was defined. We had some current here, and um, yeah, another thing that they do here, and it was defined in this way, right? And we show two important properties. Okay. <coughs> that somebody in your mind what these properties are? Yeah, I don't know. Fixed resistance. Oh, so you go ahead. I'm saying that's the same as traces. It's traces. That's traces. That's a nice one. That was because of conformal invariance, right? That was, we found that this was a consequence of the conformal world, like, sorry, of the conformal killing equation, right? And we found another one, right? This one. Never forget this one, this is very important. Okay. So look, let's just keep in mind this guy. Now, of course this guy, uh, this guy, the energy momentum tensor, somehow it's related to a charge, to a current, and the current is going to be related to a charge, right? And we know that charges are the guys that generate the transformations. Okay? So the charges associated, these guys somehow should be the generators of conformal transformations. Are these, is this line of thought clear? So we know, I mean, and this is a general thing, it's nothing to do with conformal field theory. We know that you have an operator, A, delta A is going to be equal to the commutator of Q <coughs> with A. Okay? So it's far too wet. Okay? Now, let's see how this is going to work for our case, okay? So this, remember, commutators are done at equal times. This is another important point. Okay? So let's see what's the charge associated with the energy momentum tensor. So how do you find the charge from the curve? I said it yesterday, but what would you do? You fix time, right? And then you integrate over all space, right? So in principle, you should be doing something like this. Q, be equal to this is what you have to do, right? Dx1, okay? J0. Now, of course, this fixing time 
corresponds to what in the complex plane? Corresponds to what? So this is in the cylinder. What this is in the complex plane? What's a fixed time? It's a fixed radius, right? So fixed time means that I'm choosing some thing like this, right? Okay, that's a fixed time surface, right? So it means fixed time means fixed radius. And now this integral x1, what does it mean? What am I doing with that integral? It means that I'm integrating like this, right? I'm integrating like this. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah? Okay, so this is the same, because here I should fix time and then integrate over space. Now I map this to this problem over here. Okay? But now I have complex coordinates, so it means that this is a Cauchy integral, a contouring. Count, I cannot pronounce that word. Counter, 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 Okay? Contour. I've been saying it wrong for so many years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, so that means that the charge associated with this energy momentum tensor can be written in this very nice way. So, you have some contour, okay, and then you have dz, and this is a fixed radius, right? I mean, we're going to go a bit more into the details of this. And if you remember, we learned yesterday, I think, also, that the energy momentum tensor splits also into a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic part. And this was a consequence of these two guys, right? So, we have this part, and then we have, we can do also this thing. From now on, I'm going to be writing, because there is this holomorphic and anti-holomorphic factorization, I'm going to always write this part, and I'm going to just put a C, which stands for anti chiral okay? So that, I'm, so that I maybe manage to finish my product, okay? Now, okay. Now, of course, what we want to do now is to take some operator and do this, apply this game to it, right? So we would like to take this charge and take some operator, let's call it phi, epsilon, epsilon bar, let's keep track of who are the, the generators using, and we're going to try to compute something like this, right? Q, comma, phi. Okay? So this is what we have to learn how to do. So the trick, let's, let's go blind. Let's try to see where it takes us some blind computation. So that means that we're going to compute something that looks like this, right? Counter. And then we're going to have epsilon z here, okay? Dz, comma phi. Let's make phi general for now, okay? That's what we're going to have blindly, right? On the other part. Okay, now, there is an issue. Uh, sorry, sorry, let's put, sorry, I forgot the phi here. And let's put a w, of course. This is Say that I want to change a W, right? I mean, this has to have its own thing, right? This one. Okay? Now, let's keep following our nose and let's see what happens. I mean, is it clear what I'm doing? I'm mean, just computing the commutator. The commutator goes inside the input, goes inside the input, right? Now, let's say that I just write it out. Let's say that I just expand this thing and write it like this times this, okay, minus this times this. Does anybody see a potential problem there? Did you know from normal field here? Let's say I want to compute this in general. Let's say that I have something like this. And then I want to compute, just to keep it simple, let's call it A, C, and B, W. Let's say that I want to compute this computer, right? 
I would blankly do the following. I would just write, let's say that. I would write something like DC is that DW, right? Minus DC DW AZ, right? That's what I would do blankly, right? That's a commutator, right? I just take the thing as it is and then with the minus the other side. Is there a potential problem? This this you found in your field theory course. You need to there are ambiguities, right? In field theories. What was this ambiguity? Is order? We need an order, right? And this is time order. Okay, we need a time order. You remember that. You have to put things in a time order way. Okay? So we have to time order this thing. But time order means what now? It means radial order. So we have to put radial order. This is basically the ambiguity of whether the W is inside the contour or outside the contour. contour. Okay? That's, that's a very important ambiguity. So we have to define something called radial order. Remember, this is just time order in a place where time is in this direction, right? Now, radial ordering says that R AZ DW is, can be two things, right? One can, one can, can be first before the other one, right? So, it's just AZ DW or BW AC. There are these two options, right? Now, this option is when, ah, let me write it here, big is too small. Z is larger than W, okay? And this one is otherwise, right? Okay. So, Z being before, so who is before? Who happened before? This one, right? It means W is before in time. That's that. So this is the same as time order. Okay? So that means that this thing has to be, when I, when I open this commutator, it has to be supplemented with the, with the radial order. Okay? And that's not hard to do. And it will actually have, will actually, actually will have a very nice consequence thanks to the, all this Cauchy integral stuff. Okay? Now, that means that, let me keep writing it with A and B and then we, at the end, we just put the phi back because it's just more compact. So that means that this commutator here that I'm calculating, my god, this is disgusting. Sorry, I'm really sorry. So I'm going to jump to that one and I'm going to write it here. Sorry that I made this so wet. And you see, you see that super wet? Okay. I will do it in the disgusting place. Right? So, okay, so. Let's say that we want to compute this commutator, so we have AZ BW, and that means that this thing is going to be equal to <coughs> going to be equal to what? It's going to be equal to this thing, and here, what do I have to put? What condition do I have to put in this contour? Z is greater than. W? I'm sure I'm because I'm not looking at it. Yeah. Is that BW, right? And what's the other one? The opposite, right? You want W larger than Z. And then I have BW AZ. Is it clear what I'm doing? So to compute the commutator, you have to be careful to keep track of radial order. That's what I'm saying. Okay? Now, let's draw this on the complex plane. Let's draw the, inter the two integrals that we're doing. Okay? And uh, that's the nice thing about complex analysis, that drawings are actually very useful. So, let's see the two integrals we're doing. So we have the complex plane here. And let's say that you have the origin here. And let's put W here. Okay? 
this is w. So the first integral says that z, which is the place I'm integrating over, it's bigger than w, right? So it means that this guy, I'm taking a contour here, right? It's a horrible drawing, but it goes around w, right? Now, what's, that's the first integral. What about the second integral? Second integral, it's an integral that is going like this, right? Going inside. Does everybody agree with that? Now, the fantastic thing about complex analysis is that you can deform these contours and the integrals stay the same. Okay? You, can, you have the opportunity of sort of twisting and changing the contours. So you can do the following game. You can transform this guy into... Notice that there is a minus sign in front of this one. That is the same as doing what with the contour? The same as going backwards, right? Okay? So basically, let me, let me, let me do it like this. So basically what we're doing is something that looks like this. We're doing the integral of after deformation, the fluid after deformation, the integral of something that looks like this. Here is W. Okay? Minus an integral that goes like this, right? Is it clear? This is what I'm doing, right? Now, going like this, as I told you here, with this minus, means that I'm taking it, uh, sorry, it becomes clockwise, right? Now, if I manage to put this contour over this contour, which I can do, I mean, there's nothing preventing me from that, I get something very nice. I get that actually I am integrating only around W. Is it clear for everybody what I did? This is just because of all this complex analysis stuff. Okay? So means that this commutator actually amounts for computing the integral only around the W. And W is the function of the of the guy that I'm commuting with, the guy upon which I am acting with the charge. Okay? So let's summarize this thing. Summarize this thing over here. This thing means that the, the change of phi under some form of transformation just a blank form of transformation, equals, so these are W are the insertion points, equals to the integral. And this is a notation I'm going to use from now on. This means a counter that encircles W, okay? Counter that encircles W of dz, uh, let me put epsilon z, radial ordering of T phi W. Plus the anti-chiral Is it clear? That's what it le it's left in the end. Now, okay, it seems like we haven't done a big deal, okay? But actually, we we found something very nice. We're going to be able to find something that is called an operator product expansion. We're going to use this thing for primary operators. So we know how a primary operator transform under this. Do you remember that? We know that a primary operator, when I apply a conformal transformation, infinitesimal conformal transformation, we checked out how it transformed, right? It was this thing like H, D, epsilon, etc. And right. That will allow us, using the Cauchy theorem, to find what the radial ordering of this product is. And that's called an operator product expansion, right? We've done this also before in some in the in the lectures. Conformal bootstrap or something like that. Okay? So just to remind you, we knew that for a primary field, for a primary field, delta phi w w bar was equal to, I, I always forget, h dz 
epsilon plus epsilon dc plus the anti-carol part of phi z. You remember how this transformation came about, right? I mean, we told you, I told you last time that primary fields are fields that when you act with a conformal transformation, they just transform with this, they just pick in front of df, dz to the h. And just by expanding around a small epsilon, you find that these are the transformations. Okay? It's a very simple thing. Now, what I'm telling you is that this thing equals this thing. Now, what can we do with that? What would you do if I tell you, figure out this guy? Or at least the singular part, because that's the only thing you would be able to figure out. That's a hint. Yeah, that's a hint. That's a big hint. I erase what you think. How? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So you, I cannot give you the OPE to find the OPE. That's cheating. <laughs> this is how you find the OPE. But, but okay, yeah, the OPE is the keyword. Let's say that I tell you, give you a very simple thing. Let's say I tell you that I have some counter integral of some uh, function. Uh, uh, let me put CW here. And I tell you that this is some derivative of some function dw. What would you do? What kind of thing relates you counter integrals to derivatives of stuff? It's a very nice formula, very famous formula. Who does that? Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's the Cauchy formula, right? There is this very nice formula that tells you, so this is an important thing to know. This is his toolbox. It's to know that there is this formula that tells you that the nth derivative of some complex, some analytic function, let me put that set zero here, can be written as n factorial over 2 pi i and counter that in circles z0 okay, of uh, f z. It's a very important problem, right? So this is somehow telling you what is on this side. So for example, here you have the epsilon, right? So there are derivatives here of the function, right? So basically this will allow us to figure out this thing. For example, if I get the first derivative of epsilon, it means that I have what here? According to that formula, it means that I have a one over what? One over z minus w squared, right? If, no, if somebody is not understanding, please ask. It's important to understand. So you see, this thing is equal to this thing for a primary field, right? So what we're trying to figure out is this box. Now, I got a d epsilon. Epsilon is basically the f now, right? So I have on this side an F1, right? So that means that I have Z minus, let's call W, Z0, Z minus W, 1 plus 1 is 2. So it means that I have a, in this thing, whatever it has, it has a 1 over Z minus W squared. Now, what about this guy? Okay, so your job, I already told you how this goes. I will, tell, I will give you the OPE and, you, and we'll try to figure out which part comes from where, okay? So the OPE, I mean that, by the OPE I mean the R, T, phi. And this is going to be an important equation, so we're going to box it. Equal to R, let me see, T of Z. 
Here. Can you see? Yeah. E of z phi w w bar equals to h over z minus w squared phi w w bar, okay? Plus one over z minus uh, w d w phi w w bar plus dot dot dot. I'll tell you what the dot 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 is. Okay. So the dot 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 are the non-singular terms. Okay. Non-singular terms in a Cauchy integral are zero. Right. I mean the contribution to the integral is zero. Why? Because I can deform the contour and make it vanish, right? That's a way of understanding. Now, let's see where this a term came from. Why do I say this term is here? So let's say this term is here, so it appears here. So it means that I have epsilon z times h z minus w in this thing, right? I apply the Cauchy formula, and it, I have a square, so it means that I have a derivative, so it's this guy, exactly, right? I have a derivative acting on epsilon. And I have an h, right? That's why I put the h here. Okay, that's it. Now this one, it's even easier, right? I have z minus w, that's just a simple pole, right? So it means that I just have to evaluate epsilon and w, right? And that's it. And you have to do the same for the antichiral side, right? The antichiral will be with the dc bar, this thing you have the same. So this is the OPE for a primer. And actually, it can be used as a definition of a primary. Okay, a primary field. It's a field that has this OB with the with the stress energy tensor. Okay. Now, from now on, I'm going to drop the R. Okay, I'm going to drop this R. I'm not going to be telling you that we have radial ordering, but we always have radial ordering. Okay, something that it's always going to be there. And now. Let's move on to the most famous operator that it's not a primary. And it's the only non-primary that we're going to mention. And uh, can you guess which one is the other really important operator? Stress, stress tensor itself, right? The stress tensor itself is a very important operator. And it turns out that it's not a primary. Okay? And it will, you will see that the fact that it's not a primary is at the root of all the story of the central extension that we were talking yesterday. So in the tutorial we did this extension, we found that there is this C times some things, and um, why do you put it there? I mean, it looks like you're just complicating your life. It turns out to be very important physically, it's not just uh, exercise on blah blah. It's really, really an important thing. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be very sketchy about the OPE of the stress tensor because it's actually not so simple. Okay, so I'm going to explain it a bit, but uh, exponentiating it, you see the, the exponentiation meaning when epsilon is not small, it's quite complicated. Okay, I, mean, I, I, was, I, I was going over it, not so nice, but uh, I will explain you how it goes. Okay, so let me start just by writing the OPE, and then we're going to try to, to see that it makes sense. Okay, we're going to follow that path. So the OPE. The stress tensor, and remember that there is always a radial order in front of everything. My God, this is disgusting. There are no white ones. No whites. No. Can give you dirty whites. Yeah. If you have Yeah. Yeah. I will go on with pink for a while. And uh, an orange. It's not bad. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so what's the OPE for the stress tensor? So, Z, this is this you can see, right? Yeah. Please tell me about it. Tz, Tw, okay? It's going to be equal to, and uh, 2, Z minus W to the 4. Okay, so notice that's immediately you see that it's not a primary, right? <laughs> you can use from now on this as a definition of primary. So there is already something weird, right? And notice that the weird guy is proportional to C. So the physics of the stress tensor, what makes it so special, somehow <coughs> should have something to do with C. Okay, these are just hints that you get on the way. Okay? 
plus 2dw, and then you have z minus w squared, and then you get the last guy. These things might want to just trust myself. W, sorry, z minus w. Okay? Now, notice that, let's say that I were in a theory, which they exist, but they are actually really weird, where the central charge is zero. Would be a primary, right? You see, if this guy weren't there, we would have a primary operator with which conformal weight? Two, two. H equals two, right? Two, two, just two. So the conformal, I mean, you can think about it as a almost a primary operator. Thanks a lot. Now, this is the lecture is going to improve a lot. So this one is important. Please remember this one. Okay? At least remember that the key point was this guy here. That there is a contribution that makes it non-primary. And the contribution is proportional to C over 2. Now, how do we actually show that this is the OPE. There are, there are many ways of doing it. Okay? Uh, one is to actually use the word identities from the very beginning. That's, uh, and you can find the two ways in the Francesco's uh, book. Okay? So one is actually use the, the word identities or the school. And the other one is using something similar to what I was doing before. But I'm going to actually propose you a slightly different way that it's a consistency check. Okay? It's just a consistency check, but I think it's a nice exercise for you to do it if you are interested in learning more about this. Okay? And that consistency check is to realize one little thing. So remember that the stress tensor, its job was to generate conformal transformations. Now, we said before that there were some generators of the conformal group, right? Didn't we say that before? Who were the generators of the conformal group? The L's, right? We said all oh, these cells generate conformal transformations. Go ahead. Sorry, okay. You said uh, when C is zero, <coughs> the stress energy tensor is... Would behave like a primary, right? Why do you say behave like a primary when it seems to fit the bill for what we define as a primary? The thing is that uh, C equals to zero field theory is a really weird okay. animal. So, for example, they, they, they do weird stuff. You, you find that there are logarithmic divergences in correlators. Weird things happen. It's called low CFD. <coughs> so, so, yeah, for, for people that are interested, C equals to zero is a strange thing. Generally, they give you some things, log CFDs, that are strange, but cool. I mean, they give you, for example, models of population and things like that are modeled by C equals to zero CFD. Okay? But uh, that's why I said behavior. I mean, it's not so clear how these theories behave. Okay. Now, okay. So now what else? What was I? Ah, see, yeah. So the stress energy tensor generates conformal transformation, right? That that's that's clear to everyone, right? But we also saw that infinitesimally, infinitesimally, the conformal group is generated by these Villa solo generators, right? That's that was the point, the whole point of that algebra. So there must be a relationship between these two things, right? I mean, somehow the Villa solo generators and the stress tensor cannot be independent because they generate the same thing. So I'm going to tell you what's the relationship between them. The relationship is that the Villasoro generators are nothing but the Laurent modes of the, of the stress energy tensor. So if I were to expand, you can always do this, right? It's a metamorphic function. You can expand the stress tensor. You expand it like this. And the coefficients of this expansion are the, the Villasoro. Okay, that's, 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 that's another way of understanding the L's. Okay? And now, that means that an alternative way of writing LM is by computing, let me see, this I always have to put the normalizations right. I think I need, so I need some help guys. So let's say I want to get from this integral the LM. What do I have? I have to take T and multiply it by some, let me put this here. And multiply it by some power of z. What's that power? If I want to find ln. It's 
a little exercise in applying that one, right? I think it's a nice exercise. There is no difficulty <coughs> hitting the LN or anything, right? So it means that what power do I have to have on this side? This has to be, this has to be Z minus, well, in this case, it's just Z minus zero, right? Z minus zero to one, right? So what do I have to multiply to get the one? N plus one, perfect, N plus one. Okay, so that's another way of finding the, the Vita sort of rank. Okay, so this is a useful relationship. Now, what I would like you to show, and um, I don't think it's that hard. Um, yeah, I don't think it's that hard. But try to do it. I mean, if you get stuck, drop by my office and, and we, we check it together. Is that the Vida Solo algebra? You remember the famous Vida Solo algebra? Go ahead. Please explain that again, please. So, so I want to get this one as it is, right? I mean, forget about these fancy stuff being conformal transformations and whatever. I have a, a log on series, and I have this coefficient here, and I want to extract the coefficient from the series. So I do it with, you know, I take advantage of that formula, because what that formula is that it will kill everything but the guy I need. But for that, I need to tune this power correctly. And I have to tune it correctly to what? I have to tune it correctly to B mean 1 over Z. So I have a minus n minus 2, so I need to kill as many guys as possible and re end with 1 over z, so it's n, this will kill 1, and a plus 1 will give me 1. And then I do the integral and it just isolates this guy. Okay? So just a residue computation. Okay? Now, you remember this bit as solo algebra. Let's write it just for Just because yesterday we showed together how this algebra was, right? I mean, that was our exercise last time. We found out where this 12 comes from also. And we found out this thing, right? So this algebra, if you were to compute this algebra using this definition, this is a homework I'd like to do. Take this definition, you plug it here, it's equivalent to having this. Okay? So at least it's a nice exercise to do, to check the consistency between this OPE, sorry, there are not single terms, between this OPE here and this uh, algebra. Okay? So it's a very nice exercise to do. Okay, so let me see. Of course, I will not make it to entanglement entropy as predicted. No. Well, I, I will tell you a bit about it, but I will not uh, do the explanation. Is it clear what the exercise would be? So you would have to put this one with this, and you would have two integrals, right? So it's, it's a tricky one. You have to play everything. So you have two integrals, and you will have to show that somehow. I mean, the key is to first understand this guy, the one with the C, because that one you can keep. You can follow it through the full story, okay? So you will see that precisely we give you this thing. It's very nice. And these M's will come from the powers. It's actually quite cool. It's a cool exercise. Now, let me finish this part of the stress tensor with the transformation of the stress tensor. With the transformation of the stress tensor. How does the stress tensor transform under conformal transformations itself? Okay? That is already inside here, right? OPEs tell you how, how, the, how things transform on the conformal transformation. So for the stress tensor, the transformation is actually a bit strange. So can anybody remind me how it was for a primary? What happened with the primary? Exactly. exactly. You just got the derivatives of, of the transformation with respect to Z to the conformal weight. So for the stress tensor, I'm going to tell you what it is, and then I'm going to try to explain you where it comes from. Okay? So <coughs> Pz, the transformation is going to be Vf Vz to the 2 times T, let's say, f of z. Up until now, it's just like a primary, right? Just like a primary, because we said that if this guy was a primary, its weight would be 2. So that's exactly what, uh, what you were saying, right? The derivative to the weight and this thing. But that's not all. You get an extra contribution. This extra contribution proportional to C, as it should be, right? Because we saw that the transformation without the C was just like the prime. Okay? So it's C over 12 times, which notation I chose again? S, F, of Z, of Z. I will tell you what this thing is. And you will find, even in 
probably 10 minutes, but sometimes people write it like this. This thing, we write it like F of Z, Z, okay? It's just two notations of the same thing. And this, called this, this thing is called the Schwarzian derivative. Schwarzian derivative is, you may see, I always get the signs wrong. Let's call W the F of Z. So just to short conversation, it's going to be W triple prime squared over W prime squared minus W double prime squared over W prime. Square and this is not square. Okay, this is it. So it's just one some weird derivative operator, right? It's just some really weird derivative operator, but it has triple derivatives. Okay, we're gonna compute it if we get time for a simple case, and it's, it's not a big deal. Just write it down in mathematics and never do it again. Just, I mean, it's just a derivative. It's just a set of derivatives. But the important thing here is the following. Imagine that I have, if I'm mapping. Some, uh, let me put an example. For example, this cylinder story. You see, when you map under a conformal transformation, it might be that you pick up something here. So, for example, if you were in, 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 in the plane, vacuum, no fancy problems, nothing weird is going on, what do you think is the expectation value of the stress tensor? Zero. Wild guess. Zero, right? I mean, should be zero, right? Now, if I map this somewhere else, it might pick up something, right? It might be that this thing is non-zero, and the expectation value now is something. And that something is proportional to C. And that's a Casimir energy. Okay? That's why C is so important physically. C can give you the Casimir energy of the form of it. Yeah. Which is, I mean, Casimir energy is a really important thing, right? So, uh, yeah, that's a thing. Now, how do we check that this is true? Okay? So in principle, you should, Take this thing and start uh, until you manage to integrate the transformation. That that's hard, right? But at least you can check if you can check that it works. That's that's uh, at least one step. And I will tell you how to check that it works. Okay. So a way to check that it works is to do what? You do what we did for the primary, but backwards, right? We, what we did for the primary is that we knew how the primary transformed. And then from the way it transformed, we compared it to the commutator, and that allowed us to find the OB. Now I'm giving you the OB, so you go backwards. So I take, you take the OB, and you try to see what's on the other side, right? So you want to find delta epsilon, epsilon bar of t, right? Let me put t, well, let me put tz, tz. And that's going to be equal to what on the other side? It's going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi i. An integral that has w inside, right? Of dz and uh, w to w t uh, w dz, right? That was the definition of a change in uh, of a change by under a conformal transformation, right? The delta phi was precisely equal to this thing, okay? Here, where here we were putting a phi, but now phi is t. So all you have to do is to plug this OPE there, okay? And then you calculate the residue. So for example, just notice, you will get, let's forget about this guy first. We will get a part that has one derivative of epsilon, right? Does everybody, everybody sees that? You have a guy with one derivative of epsilon. You will have a guy with no derivatives of epsilon, but a derivative of tau only. Okay, you will have that guy. What else? Now, that one. What will you have on the other side? How many derivatives of epsilon? We have three derivatives of epsilon. You will see that these are precisely this. Okay? Precisely here. So if you were to write, now how to compare, now you take this short term derivative, I gave you that, that there, and write f as z plus epsilon z, and you compare you compare order by order, I mean to order epsilon, sorry, you compare term by term to order epsilon, you will see that this exactly matches this. Okay. 
So at least infinitesimally, it's not hard to check that you get the Schwarzschild derivative. Now, if you want to exponentiate the transformation, remember, these are transformations, in, this is the Lie algebra, right? So this is infinitesimal. So if you want to find the actual large transformation, that's a bit of an ordeal, but it, it can be done, of course. Okay. So, uh, Costas is here already. So, I, I was going to... Show me. Huh? Show me the Ah, so you are just... Ah, okay. okay. So, keep going. And, sorry, guys. So, okay. So, please check this. Check this, this thing and the consistency of this with the Virasoro algebra. Okay? If you manage to do these little two things, you're really well... You're ready to start doing cool stuff with, uh, with this uh, conformal field. Now, I kept advertising that one of the features of conformal field theory that was very nice is that it told you what was the exact form of some correlators. So I'm just going to go very brief over that and tell you that. And tell you that it actually tells you a great deal about some endpoint functions. So, for example, the two point functions of primaries, okay? I'm not going to talk about primaries. The two point functions of primaries, the functional form is totally fixed by conformal transformation, okay? So, I will write, I will tell you what it is. Three point functions. Three-point functions, almost, there is a constant that is very hard to find in the end. But, so they, it's, it finds them up to some structure constant that you find with bootstrap, actually. But you can't find with bootstrap. And here I just use the global, here you just have to use the global transformations. Global transformations help you fix this. And four-point functions, fixes them up to some constant. Okay? So it gives you something called conformal blocks, which are kind of like the DNA of the conformal field theory. Okay? So it takes you very far. Remember, if you were to do this in a normal field theory, this is very hard, actually. And maybe, maybe, I mean, the ones that haven't done conformal field theory, uh, sorry, quantum field theory, cannot see how hard it is to find these things in general. Here you know exactly what you're going to get. Up to some constants that you have to find, which are not so easy to find anyway. But, okay. Right? So, let me tell you, well, I don't think I'll have much time, but let me tell you what I wanted to do, really fast, okay? So I wanted to explain you there is this subject that people are, well, I am very excited about and so on people, that it's called the entanglement entropy. So we're computing this thing uh, that it tells you how entangled are different parts of a system, okay? It tells you how the quantum information is organized in a system. And I wanted to teach you how to compute the entanglement entropy for a CFD because it's very easy, and actually it's a very recent result. I mean, uh, people did it, I mean, uh, 2005, maybe, so it's relatively recent, right? And for that, you only need a very few things. So if in some moment you want to go and read the paper, I think you can read it already. So you have to know two things about CFDs. One is how the stress tensor transforms, which I already told you. How this Schwarzschild and derivative story, which I told you, you just have to plug it in mathematically. You get something, right? And you have to know the form of the two point functions. That's all you need to know. And with that, you manage to get the full, you manage to get a very, very important and highly cited paper if you were to do this 10 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, so how does it go to fit these two point functions? So the story goes, I'm just going to say it because the, maybe. We don't have tutorials today, right? No. No, of course not. We have the graph. Okay. So let me do the two-point function, just very fast. Okay? Let's do the two-point function, so at least I do part of the advertising. So let's say that I want to take two primaries. I want to compute. So let's call this function, it's going to be a function of z and w, let's call this function g, z, comma, w. So now we want to start applying the different symmetries of the global, of the global conformal group. 
So it's translationally bad, right? That's the first. It has to be translationally bad. So what does that tell tell you about uh, that thing? About G? Let's say that I compute that. Let's say that I compute. Let's say that this is space. Okay, and I compute it. I mean, space or time. And I compute the two point <coughs> function between points A and B. Now I said that it's translational invariant, right? So it means that if I were to do at A plus C and B plus C, should I get the same? Right. So it means that it depends on what? On the difference, right? So that's the first thing. Of course, this is in the complex distance, right? So it means that G, Z, W is a function of this thing, right? It's a function of the distance between the, the two to insertion. Okay? That's the first thing we find. Now, what else do we find? Right? I could have put just C minus W. It's, it's Let's just do it for a kind of C minus W. Now, what else do we know? So that was translation. That, now, what do dilatations tell you? What happens if I do a dilatation? What should happen? So let's see. Let's try to buy a dilatation. So this is a dilatation. And that means that I'm gonna want I'm gonna study this. Let's call it H1. Let's call it phi1 and phi2. Let's start even with different fields. Let's see okay. Different fields. So we have lambda. H1, and then you get phi, 1, lambda, z, okay? Lambda, h2, phi, lambda, z2, okay? This is how the thing will transform on the rotation. It's clear to everybody. Notice that this is true for a quasi-primary, right? Doesn't even have to be primary. It just needs to be quasi-primary. You remember, because the primaries are the guys that only move the flow okay? So it transforms like that, okay? So let me pull out this guy. The lambda h1 plus h2, right? And this basically, what we said before, is just lambda z minus w, right? But I'm asking the theory to be conformal in direct. So this has to be equal to what? This thing, it's equal to what? To the original one, right? I mean, that means invariant. Invariant means that this thing has to be just g of z minus w, right? Is it clear? Okay. So let's impose that. That's the condition that is going to give a restriction, right? That's how symmetries give restrictions, right? I mean, in the most elementary way, right? You just take the thing, you transform it. It has to be equal as if it as what it was before, and that gives you condition, and then you solve it. And that's why symmetry is so convenient. So. Um, okay, so so let's see. So that means that this thing is equal to G Z minus W. What does that tell you? I mean, this takes a little guessing, right? but it's a nice guessing actually. Tells you that somehow this guy. This lambda, let's say that I were able to take the lambda out. I have to pay something for the lambda, right? I mean, because I don't know what G is. But I want it to come out in such a way that it kills this guy. So any guess of what the function should be? You need a function that has this homogeneity scale, right? That the lambda comes like that power over there. Yeah, I'm going to write it down. That means, and I'm going to write it for you, and then you're going to try to understand why what I say is true. This thing has to be equal to some constant, let's call it 1, 2, of z minus w, okay, to some power. What's the power? Come on, guys. Exactly. 
H1 plus H2, right? That's it. That's the only thing I could do, right? It's a function that for any value of lambda, I just do this thing, and we get a lambda here, pull it out, it will cancel this guy. Okay, so this is, so look how far we got already with conformal symmetry, right? But really, really far. If we had only translation invariance, we know this. This is very little information. Well, it's something, but it's not a big, it's not a great deal. This is big information. I mean, this is telling you that it doesn't matter in which situation you are. Your two-point function is going to be just this ratio. There's someone. It's Kevin, right? Yeah, just this. Now, so basically, in terms of Vila Soro, here we acted with n plus one. Here we act with n zero, okay. And now let's see what happens if we act with n minus one. So I'm just going to tell you very fast what you will find, and this is going to be a little exercise also for you. You will find that n minus one implies that h one has to be equal to h two. What does that mean? This means that primaries with different h's <coughs> do not couple don't have two point function. They don't mix, families don't mix. That's a huge deal, right? So please check it. And the way to check it is basically to remember what the um, what the n minus one does, which essentially is an inversion. Okay? So you will basically take this function here and map, I mean let me tell you, let me sketch the proof for you very fast. So you're gonna take z and w to minus one over z. Right? So you do this map. And also for W. Right? And now that thing, whatever you get on the other side, has to be equal to this. That's symmetry. You will see that the only way that that can be true is not, it's very easy to see, is if H1 is equal to H2. Okay? So we find already three important conclusions about two point functions. Two point functions are important. Two point functions. Two point functions. Two point functions. Two point functions are important. And we found their total form, and we found that conformal primaries never mix with each other. Okay? So I'm going to leave it there, and uh, it's a shame that we didn't get to see.